Hello viewers, welcome back to the channel. In this particular video, we are going to talk about Kubernetes architecture. In the last video, we have discussed about what is container orchestrator, why we should, why we required it, and why Kubernetes, right? So now we want, we are going to understand the architecture of Kubernetes. So basically, in a Kubernetes, there are uh, two kinds of nodes we have. Okay, one we call it as a master node. Okay, one we call it as a master node and we can have a any number of worker nodes okay we can have a any number of worker node we call all this as a worker node now how many worker node we require that is completely depending on how many microservices we are going to deploy how many instance of each microservices we are going to uh, deploy what is the resource requirement for each microservices right and what is the capacity of each node depending on that you can decide how many nodes we wanted to create okay or add into this cluster so cluster is nothing but a, just a collection of multiple servers okay and out of that uh, one one could be a master and other would be worker right so now how it works how kubernetes internally works if you want to deploy any microservice okay so let's discuss basically first thing is in a master node we have few major components basically those are kind of a heart of your uh, master node okay the first one we call it as a api server okay so this is kind of a interface okay every request coming in or coming uh, going out from this master goes via this api server we have another component called as a etcd so etcd is a no sql database so overall everything about the kubernetes cluster is stored under this database right the third thing we have is scheduler now in a container orchestration video the last video that we have seen where we talked about we need a scheduling mechanism so basically uh, on a master node we have one scheduler component and the fourth one is controller now what is the need of a controller that is something we'll talk about in a bit so these are the four major components are there on the master node and on each node okay when i'm saying each node master as well as worker so on each node we'll have a four components okay i'll write that here the first one is a container runtime engine so this container runtime engine is nothing but a, you can say it's a docker so that will be there on each node master as well as worker node the second thing that would be there on the uh, each node is a kubelet so kubelet is a kind of a you can consider it as a uh, captain of the node okay which is responsible for doing all the actions on that node okay that's the second component third one is Cube proxy and fourth one is a CNI plugin. Okay, so CNI plugin is nothing but a container network interface. So we'll talk about uh, each of this component, but this four components would be there on each node, master as well as all the worker nodes. Right now, <clears throat> to interact with the master node, there are different ways. Okay, you can interact via the UI. Okay. The second way is we can use simply a REST APIs and the third way is CLI. Okay, these are the three different ways through which we can interact with the master node. Okay, so the most popular way is CLI. Okay, so and from the Kubernetes community, we have one CLI, we call it as a cube CTL or we call it as a cube control. Okay, so each of this component, okay, whichever we are using that basically interacts with the API server okay all these three components if you wanted to use they interact with the api server so for every external request that is coming that will come to the api server but mostly use the cli uh, utility that is kubectl right now 
when we create a cluster basically what happens cluster is nothing but a kind of a collection of master and worker nodes okay as soon as we create a cluster so we'll talk about how to create a cluster practically okay but you can just consider for now the cl cluster is nothing but a collection of master and worker nodes okay so as soon as we create a cluster okay uh, we'll have all these components available on each node okay in fact this four component on each node and this four component only on a master node so kubelet is someone basically is responsible for managing the complete node okay that can be a master or a worker so kubelet is responsible for sending the complete information about that node to the api server okay even if it is a master on master as well we'll have a kubelet and that will keep sending the whole information about the master to api server and api server will store that information into the etcd so etcd is a key store key value store database okay that is where everything about the uh, that node or that cluster will be saved now now let's say this is now our cluster is ready okay all the components we have installed and now we wanted to deploy our application or a microservice inside this kubernetes cluster how all these components interact with each other and how our microservice gets deployed on one of the node so what happens basically in a kubernetes there are different types of objects like for example we have a deployment object we have a stateful set object we have a service object we have a job cron job daemon set so there are a lot of different types of objects are there in kubernetes now every object has some use case like for example let's say you want to use a deployment so in which case we, we should use deployment? What are the uh, behavior of that deployment? Okay, so when we are, we are going to see all those objects and their behavior. So once we understood those, okay, we can take a easily decision on which, which particular object of Kubernetes we should use it to deploy our microservice. Okay, so for now, let's consider that we have one UI microservice. Let's say Flipkart UI microservices service we have. And that for that, we already written a Docker file. We created a Docker image and that image we already pushed to the uh, registry, some registry, right? And now from that image, we wanted to deploy this UI microservice on the Kubernetes cluster. So how we can do that? So basically there is something called as a YAML file, okay? Or a configuration file, file we call it as. So if you wanted to use a deployment object, basically we need to write this YAML file where you will say that the name of the object that we wanted to use, okay, or the kind of object that we wanted, Kubernetes object that we wanted to use to deploy our microservice, okay, uh, give some custom name to your UI microservice, what image we are using, on which port it is running, okay, which volume you have attached. So all this configuration you need to define it here, okay, then we can provide this YAML to the kubectl. So kubectl will send this request to the API server. Okay, API server will take that request. Okay, it will do some uh, basically kind of a validation of that request. Okay, so about complete validation, authentication, authorization for about all that process. Will I'll, I'll take I'll create a separate, completely separate video where we'll talk about more in detail. Okay, but for now it will take the request. So now API server has the information about that request. Okay. So it will take that request and it will put it in a one queue. Okay. So that queue is something that scheduler keep watching on. So as soon as there is an, any new request comes in, it will first see that whether that request is scheduled or not. If not, what scheduler does, it will request API server that, okay, give me all the node details. Now, how API server is getting that node detail? Basically, whenever we create a cluster from every node, the kubelet will send the complete information about that node to the API server and API server will store that into the ETCD. So when scheduler is requesting, it will fetch from the ETCD and send it back to the scheduler. Now, scheduler has a information about existing capability of each node. Along with that, it also aware about the new request and what is the requirement of that new request. So scheduler has a clear visibility of what is required and what is available. 
So based on that, it has some internal algorithm. It will apply some best algorithm and it will try to find the best node. Let's say you have a hundred node out of that hundred node. It will try to get you the best node where you can schedule this microservice. Okay. And it will inform the API server that, okay, uh, the, let's say node two is the best node to deploy this microservice. So API server will take that request and it will send that request here uh, to the kubelet, kubelet of this node. So kubelet will take that request. Okay. And with the help of container runtime engine, that is nothing but a Docker. It will create that microservice here in the form of containers. Okay. Now in a Kubernetes term, we call it as a pod. But we are yet to talk about what is pod. So for now, consider we are creating a, a container here. So this is a typical process of deploying your microservice. We have to just write a file. Once you write the file, give it to the API server. API server will give it to the scheduler. Scheduler now has a visibility of what is available, what is required. So it will choose the best node and give it to API server. API server will send that request to the kubelet. And kubelet along with a docker, okay, basically it creates that container. Now, what is the need of kube proxy and CNI plugin? So basically uh, in a docker sessions, we talked about the creating a network for each container, the giving the IP, the exposing the port, okay. Uh, doing a port forwarding, doing a port binding. There are a lot of networking stuff we need to do it, right? So similarly, here as well, in a Kubernetes cluster as well, in fact, here we need to do a lot of extra things because now here networking is across multiple machines, right? In a Docker, we have seen we are doing networking only on a single machine. But now here in this Kubernetes cluster, we need to do the networking across the multiple machine. We call it as a overlay networks, right? So now it's not easy to do it all the manual step like, okay, giving the IP to the container, okay, adding IP table role, exposing the port, whenever we are deleting the container, releasing all that, removing the IP table rule. Okay, there is a lot of work we need to do it. But the CNI plugin, container network interface plugin, okay, there are a lot of plugins like Calico is there, uh, Flannel is there, okay, View Network is there. So there are a lot of open source uh, CNI interface plugins available. So basically, they will work with the kube proxy to make sure that all this networking requirement is satisfied for each and every content, right? So that's the use of kube proxy and CNI. Now you might have a question like, what is the use of controller? Okay, so basically controller is used for giving an high availability to your microservice. So how it works? So let's consider uh, you have, uh, you are creating a UI microservice, right? So now when we create a Kubernetes object, what happens is basically on the master side, there is one controller object also gets created. And the responsibility of that controller object is to make sure that the desired and current state is matching. So let's say here you are specifying that, okay, I need one UI microservice to be created. Okay. So as soon as uh, with this, the flow that we just talked about, container got created. This uh, kubelet is someone who is continuously after some interval, continuously keep sending complete information about this node to the API server and API server is saving that into the ETCD. Okay. And controller also frequently asking the API server that, okay, give me the information about basically that microservice. Okay, because this is a specific controller for that microservice. So this controller will continuously keep asking to the API server that, okay, give me current state of that microservice. So now our current state is we required one instance to be running all the time. And what is the desired? So every time controller asks for the API server, okay, what is the desired? What is the desired state? If the current and desired state is matching, it will not do anything. Your container is still running. So controller will not do anything. But due to some reason, let's say this container goes down. Okay, obviously when controller is fetching the information, the current in a state of the information of that container, and if it is zero, that means if that container is not matching, controller will quickly act upon it and it will inform the API server that, okay, you need to create a, another container for this microservices, 
and the process again same like api server will put that request into the scheduler scheduler will take it choose the best node send it to the api server and api server will send it to the one of the node okay so this is how this controller will make sure that our microservice is running keep running all the time right so this is how we are going to provide the high availability to our application right so these are few components are work together to make sure that our application deployment works very smooth so i hope everyone understood the architecture of kubernetes we'll see more detail on how to set up a kubernetes cluster and how we'll walk through all these components how it looks like inside the cluster okay yeah so just uh, put your comments in the comment section to know whether you guys understood the kubernetes architecture or not if you have any question just use the comment box I'll make sure that I'll reply to those comments and you'll understand that architecture completely. So thanks everyone for watching this video. If you are not subscribed to the channel, please do subscribe, like and share with your network. Thanks everyone.